Let's chat. What are we chatting about today? Hudson River Park. The concept of a waterfront park now seems very common when mentioned. In large cities, it seems that waterfronts should naturally have parks, and the first row of properties along the waterfront tends to be more upscale residences. However, this is actually a phenomenon that has developed only over the past few decades. Today, we are going to talk about one of the most classic waterfront parks in Manhattan, New York, Hudson River Park. This park is the second largest in Manhattan, only smaller than Central Park. In other episodes, we've talked about Hudson Yards and mentioned the High Line. These two places are closely related to Hudson River Park we are discussing today. Basically, understanding Hudson River Park and the High Line plus Hudson Yards gives a very good overview of the urban development on the west side of Manhattan. Of course, we are currently talking about Manhattan, south of Central Park. We will gradually discuss the area north of Central Park in the future. As for Hudson River Park, it has a clear boundary. Not all parks along the Hudson River are part of Hudson River Park. The park starts at the southern tip along the Hudson River, north of Battery Park City, excluding Battery Park City, and extends north to 59th Street, which is the southern border of Central Park. The park is nestled between the Hudson River and the road closest to the river, making it a very long, narrow park. It spans about four miles, approximately 6.4 kilometers, whereas the previously mentioned High Line is 1.45 miles long, about 2.3 kilometers. So, Hudson River Park is roughly three times the length of the High Line. If I had to choose the biggest highlight of Hudson River Park, it would definitely be Little Island. Which is very beautiful and very cool. Before discussing Hudson River Park, we need to first understand a bit about its history, starting from before it was a park. If we start with the history of Manhattan Island, rewinding the clock back 400 years, what would Manhattan Island have looked like? In the book Manhattan, Dr. Eric Sanderson simulated the appearance of Manhattan Island in the year 1609 through his research. We can infer that 400 years ago, this area was probably a forest with many hills and wetlands. There were already several Native American tribes living on the island and along the banks of the Hudson River. These tribes lived the life of hunting and fishing. It wasn't until 1626 that the Dutch bought the island from the Native Americans, marking the beginning of the colonial era for Manhattan. Some fun facts: During Dutch control. Manhattan was known as New Netherland, and Lower Manhattan was called New Amsterdam. Later, when the British took control from the Dutch, they renamed it New York. The name we use now, Manhattan, is derived from Manhattan, which was the Native American name for the island, meaning "island of many hills." From the late colonial era, we can see from historic maps how Manhattan, as a port city, Had its shoreline continuously expanding outward with the city's development, especially around Midtown and Lower Manhattan. The area of today's Hudson River Park was still underwater two to three hundred years ago. As for the land, in 1811, the New York City government issued an urban planning map that created the current grid system of Manhattan's streets and the method of street naming. What I just mentioned is a very brief history of the island of Manhattan. If we return to the current area of Hudson River Park, I think we can look at the urban spatial development history of this area from two perspectives: one from the river and the other one from the land. From the river's perspective, before the industrial age, the banks of the Hudson River actually had very rich oyster reef formations. Before the Europeans arrived, the Native Americans were probably already eating oysters from here. After the Europeans arrived, the oysters of the Hudson River became a very important protein source for the people here because they were plentiful and cheap. Even from 1800 to 1850, there were many boat houses along the Hudson River's banks, moored along the river, engaged in the oyster trade. However, after the Industrial Age, with the development of river transportation on the Hudson River, the ecological environment for oysters were destroyed. And with overharvesting, the Hudson River eventually had hardly any oysters left. Even if they were, you probably wouldn't dare to eat them. So, where do the oysters come from now? From places like Maine or other parts of the U.S. East Coast, 
But now there are plans to restore these oyster reefs in Hudson River Park. So you might actually get to eat oysters from the Manhattan riverbanks in the future. But the oysters you eat during happy hour at oyster bars are all from the East Coast, although Manhattan used to have a lot of them. By the early 19th century, in the context of the first industrial revolution, steam-powered boats began operating on the Hudson River, transporting passengers and goods along the cities on the Hudson River's banks. By the late 19th century, the area of Midtown Manhattan along the Hudson River banks had developed into a bustling mid-packing district, with a large number of livestock being transported from New Jersey's banks across the Hudson River to Manhattan's mid-packing district. This is the origin of the name for the area near what's now the High Line, known as the Meatpacking District. Apart from transporting meat, by the late 19th century, with the development of the Second Industrial Revolution, transatlantic steamships began transporting raw materials, industrial products, and immigrants between Europe and New York. At that time, the goods and passengers entering and leaving the New York port were more than all other American ports combined. So by the 19th century, the Hudson River was already very busy, with river transportation along the coastal cities and transatlantic maritime traffic. And Manhattan's shoreline was constantly changed to meet usage needs, even expanding into the river bit by bit through land reclamation. Until the U.S. federal government began requiring a permanent shoreline to be defined on Manhattan's west side to further delineate clear Hudson River channels and restrict the lands that all docks could extend from the shoreline. This decision led the New York City government to start building Manhattan's shoreline in 1870, establishing the current position of Manhattan's riverbank. Later, all changes to the shoreline or construction of docks also had clear regulations, especially for the Hudson River's shoreline. This section of shoreline, made of granite and concrete, stretches from the Battery Park in the south to 59th Street in the north. It took 60 years from 1870 to complete. Due to the scale and difficulty of the engineering, as well as its significance, it was even designated as a historic landmark. The shoreline itself is a historic landmark. Then, in 1910, the new Chelsea Piers opened, mainly to accommodate transatlantic passenger liners. At that time, the British Titanic was supposed to dock at Pier 59 in 1912, after departing from a British port. Later, Titanic survivors were brought to Pier 54 to set foot in America. By the 1930s, Manhattan's shorelines, especially the Hudson River's banks, were densely packed with many docks. On the other hand, from the perspective of land, the development of the railroad system began in the 1850s, significantly changing the landscape of Manhattan's west side along the Hudson River banks. We have already mentioned this when we talked about the High Line before and also mentioned what was called Das Avenue, which is 10th Avenue. But at that time, we deliberately skipped over the relationship between the railroad and the riverbank, thinking that we could explain it further in this episode. So I think we can just take a look at the following picture, which depicts the scene along the Hudson River banks in 1912. In the center of this picture is a building labeled Terminal Warehouse, which, as the name suggests, is a terminal, meaning a train station and also a warehouse, meaning a storage facility. At that time, trains loaded with goods could directly enter this building, unload the goods directly into the warehouse, and then transport the goods to various places in Manhattan by carriages or other means of transport. This building is still standing today, located in the Chelsea community. In the area on the left-hand side of the picture, north of this building is what is now the Hudson Yards. The road along the riverbank is now 12th Avenue, and there are several docks and various types of vessels along the river. In the lower left corner, the white vessel is a steamboat transporting passengers back and forth on the Hudson River, and next to it is a larger black vessel, probably an Atlantic vessel, moored at one of the docks. In the picture, you can also see several flatboats, which are carrying several train cars. These train cars are loaded with goods to be delivered to Manhattan, coming all the way from the interior of the United States. The train then goes to the docks in New Jersey, which is on the other side of the Hudson River. And these train cars are then directly towed onto the flatboats, which then sail to the other side of the river, i.e. Manhattan. When these boats dock, there is equipment called a floating bridge between the flatboat and the riverbank, 
This floating bridge can adjust the height difference between the two ends to connect the elevation on land and the elevation on the flatboat. Finally, these train cars can be directly towed onto land, finally entering facilities like the terminal warehouse to load and unload goods. The floating bridge depicted in the picture is still preserved in its original location. So basically, this picture illustrates the relationship between the rail system and the maritime system in the 1910s. Additionally, it's worth mentioning that in the years around 1910, three tunnels had just been completed under the Hudson River for trains to connect Manhattan and New Jersey. One of these tunnels which we mentioned when discussing the Hudson Yachts is the North River Tunnel, which is currently still in use. It passes under Hudson Yachts and connects to Penn Station. So before these three tunnels were completed, transportation between Manhattan and New Jersey was actually very dependent on river transportation. Returning to land, we can see that during this period, the traffic in this area was very busy. Hence, there were also many accidents. That's why 10th Avenue and 11th Avenue were once called Das Avenue. To address this issue, the 1929 West Side Improvement Plan was implemented, which created the West Side Elevated Railroad, now known as the High Line, and St. John's Terminal, now the new headquarters building for Google. In addition, another major focus of the West Side Improvement Plan was the construction of a new West Side Elevated Highway along the Hudson River banks for cars and trucks to travel on. This road goes underground when it reaches Battery Park at its southern end and split into two directions. One goes through a tunnel under the river to connect to Brooklyn, and the other direction passes through Battery Park to finally connect to the East Side Highway in Manhattan. However, the fate of this elevated highway was quite tumultuous. Due to poor design and maintenance, after an accident in 1973, it was completely shut down. That accident was caused by a truck loaded with asphalt, which was too heavy, causing part of the elevated road to collapse. And ironically, the truck's load of asphalt was intended for repairs on the elevated road. In any case, after the West Side Elevated Highway was closed in 1973, it was demolished in 1989. Later, there were various proposals on how to improve the West Side Highway. Some suggested building a new elevated highway, some suggested making it underground, and some even planned to rebuild the highway and push it along with the riverbank hour, filling in the sea, which could also create new land for use. However, most of these proposals were abandoned due to high costs or significant environmental impacts. Finally, in the 1990s, a decision was made to rebuild the West Side Highway as a surface road, which is what we see today. At the same time, in 1998, the New York City and the state governments passed the Hudson River Park Act, which decided to plan a park between the West Side Highway and the riverbank, now known as Hudson River Park. After all this, we finally mentioned Hudson River Park, which means that before the year 2000, the appearance of the Hudson River banks had nothing to do with the park. From the very beginning, with many oysters on the riverbank, to later serving rail and maritime transportation, and finally road transportation, and the docks along the original riverbank were gradually abandoned or even demolished. The original maritime needs also gradually moved to Brooklyn or to New Jersey, to some larger, more modern industrial ports. So around the turn of the century in 2000, people finally sought to turn the space along the Hudson River banks into a park. And this is the largest park built in Manhattan after Central Park, which was planned in the 1850s. The Hudson River Park was planned in the 1990s, nearly 150 years apart. Next, we will finally talk about the current Hudson River Park. Since the Hudson River Park Act was passed by New York State in 1998, because some parts of the park fall under state jurisdiction and some under city jurisdiction, the New York State government and New York City government jointly established a public trust organization called the Hudson River Park Trust to manage the entire park's design, construction, maintenance, and operation. The members of this organization's board are appointed by both the state and city governments. The park's funding sources include federal, state, and city government allocations, and also heavily rely on the rent received from commercial spaces within the park. Of course, another part of the funding comes from fundraising from the public, which is handled by a non-profit organization called Hudson River Park Friends. You might think of the Friends of the High Line. 
the name Friends usually has something to do with fundraising. However, Friends of the High Line, in addition to fundraising, also includes work in design, construction, maintenance, and operation. So although both are called Friends, the tasks they perform are not exactly the same. Hassan River Park is located on the west side of the West Side Highway, stretching from the south side of Central Park to the north side of Better Park City. Actually, the park inside Better Park City was previously within the range of Hassan River Park, but it was separated out in 2013. We will mention Better Park City again when we talk about Lower Manhattan and the World Trade Center. The name Westside Highway is actually a common name used by everyone. This highway is divided into many segments, each with different names. The southernmost segment is called West Street. Then as you go northwest along the Hudson River, past 10th Avenue, the highway's name changes to 11th Avenue. After 11th Avenue, the name changes to 12th Avenue. Continuing north past 57th Street, the surface highway becomes an elevated highway and also changes to a different name. In general, the citizens usually refer to it as the West Side Highway, but you won't actually see West Side Highway on road signs. Additionally, there are currently five tunnels under the Hudson River that connect Manhattan to New Jersey, further connecting to the U.S. inland transportation system. Of these five tunnels, three are for trains and two are for roads. And according to the order of urban development in Manhattan, the train tunnels were built first, followed by the road tunnels. The southern tunnels were built first, then the northern ones. Among the three train tunnels, the southernmost one is called the Downtown Hudson Tubes, which passes through Battery Park City to connect to the World Trade Center. Since it's not within the scope of Hudson River Park, we'll skip it for today. A bit further north is the railway tunnel connecting to Christopher Street, called the Uptown Hudson Tubes. The last railway tunnel is the North River Rail Tunnels, connecting to Penn Station through Hudson Yachts. The newly started construction of the Hudson River Rail Tunnel will also connect to Penn Station. As for the road tunnels, the southern one is called the Holland Tunnel, and the northern one is called the Lincoln Tunnel. The neighborhoods alongside Hudson River Park from south to north are Tribeca, Hudson Square, West Village, Chelsea, Hudson Yachts, and the northernmost is Hell's Kitchen. We've previously talked about the High Line, which is very close to Hudson River Park, mainly located in the Chelsea and Hudson Yards neighborhoods. Essentially, the space of Hudson River Park is composed of the strip of riverbank space and the piers extending from the riverbank. The strip of riverbank space is actually not very wide, so it basically consists of some green belts, pedestrian paths, or bike lanes. In slightly wider areas, there might be some outdoor sports courts. As for the piers, they are a unique feature of this park. Although many piers have been demolished following the decline of ship transport, quite a few remain, about 30 or so. Each pier, depending on different ownership and usage needs, has mostly been renovated. In the next episode, we'll talk about what these piers are now used for.